and start. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, so thanks everybody for your patience. Um, natural resources in 2023, um, they, uh, our state legislators instructed them to conduct a Colorado native pollinating insects health study. Um, so those of us working to conserve pollinators in the state had the challenge of not understanding clearly what the current status of our pollinators' health is. Um, you know, how do we decide what to do, what to focus on? Um, what are we doing already that's working and what's not working? Um, generally, the findings weren't surprising. They're what you hear in the news all the time. Um, we have half as many insects in Colorado today as we did 35 years ago. Some of these are more threatened than others. Um, reasons causing this include habitat loss and fragmentation, urbanization, pesticides, pests and diseases, and climate change. So again, no surprises. But now we have this baseline uh, created by the study with which we can try and move forward in affecting pollinator uh, better affecting pollinator conservation. So a lot of this is going to be done on the larger levels of land management of large areas. So that's where um, a lot of the actions are going to have the biggest impact, um, agriculture, rangeland, forest service land, etc. But we know that we can also have an impact on smaller levels um, all the way down to our home gardens. So this is the Denver Botanic Gardens York Street campus, which is in central Denver. We have 23 acres here and we are bordered on all sides by our, by our neighborhoods. Um, so we're tightly packed in. We have 13,000 species of plants and 60 different themed gardens. Here's one of those themed gardens that was installed in 2016. This is our signature step garden. We wanted this garden to display collections that we had from four major step climates around the world. So this includes Patagonia in South America, Central Asia, South Africa, so these are just some shots of those areas in the step garden. And North America, um, the step of North America, Denver is right in, the, right in the middle of it. So we were really pleased to have created this space where we could display the, the flora of these four significant biomes in our collections, add to those collections, and this is very relevant to our high elevation semi-arid region. So a collateral effect of the installation of this garden was that the areas elsewhere in the gardens where some of these collections had previously been displayed, they were now redundant. So South African Plaza was now redundant. Um, and it gave us this incredible opportunity in this really tight space where we can't always make significant changes, um, it gave us a, an opportunity to renovate those redundant areas and bring something new to our collections. So this included the step mounds in our Plantasia garden. These were now um, displayed in the step garden. And here's South African Plaza. And this was also um, now, uh, this collection was now displayed in the step garden. In the same area was the Birds and Bees Walk, which I've been taking care of since 2006, and this is what I'm mostly going to talk to you about today. This is an aerial view of the garden in 2022. The step mounds in Plantasia are all the way up here uh, to the top left. Um, you can't see them here, but if you kept walking on that sidewalk, you'd run right into them. And South African Plaza is down in the lower right corner if you keep uh, walking on that sidewalk. And for many years, this garden was designed to demonstrate gardening for wildlife principles based on providing food, water, shelter, and nesting for pollinators, birds, and other wildlife. 
This garden itself was not made redundant by the step garden installation, but it was sandwiched in between those two redundant gardens and it itself needed infrastructure improvements. It was not ADA accessible. The irrigation system was extremely old and dry stack walls in the garden um, were starting to fail. Um, we had some stairs and a bridge that were also gonna start failing. Um, so it needed some help. So we decided to renovate the entire area um, from the uh, Plantasia down to South African Plaza. And in the end, it um, impacted seven gardens altogether that were connected. And the principles applied in this garden can also be used in home gardens, um, like I said, to address issues like climate change, habitat loss, drought, and more. So going back to 2006, when I started managing this garden, I was very new to pollinator and wildlife gardens. I began reading books, attending conferences to learn as much as I could. And it was clear that I couldn't keep all of this information in my head. Um, so I created a spreadsheet that started with all of the plants that were in the garden already. And I began to document the ecosystem services each of those plants provided according to what I was learning. And at the end of the talk, um, at the end of the talk, I have a slide, show, a slide showing many of the resources that I've used throughout this process that I'd like to share with you. So I wanted to know, so here are these plants, were they good nectar and pollen sources for pollinators? What time of the year did they bloom? What pollinators did they support? Bees, butterflies, hummingbirds? Um, were they a host plant for butterflies and moss? Did they set fruit? seed or nuts for birds and other animals. They provide nesting locations or nesting materials. Um, some of this are information already existed in the garden records. Um, but what's significant is that this was the mid to late 2000s. Um, colony collapse disorder was in the headlines. It had been identified as a significant contributor to major honeybee die-offs that were happening. And pollinator research um, started expanding significantly, um, revealing new knowledge. It seemed like every conference that I went to, there was more research being done. There was new information. Um, one of the conferences I went to last year at Penn State, they had a whole section that was just on technology and how uh, AI is being used in uh, pollinator research. Um, creating new information and also creating information, uh, making information available even faster. Um, in addition to looking at the plants that were already in the garden, I started a list of plants I wanted to add to the garden. Um, I wanted more regional, but they were difficult to establish since the garden was mature, had lots of big trees and was very shady. Um, and I learned about oaks and willows. I didn't have any oaks and willows in the garden at that time, um, but these both support hundreds of species of moss and butterflies. I think willows are documented as uh, host plants for like 400 different moss and butterflies and oaks support like twice as many, twice as many species. Finally, around this time, I came across a study and it showed that some of those plants that we think of as must have pollinator garden plants. Again, this was back in uh, early 2000s. Some of them weren't as attractive as previously thought. Um, so I'm looking at these plant lists I've been making and I'm wondering, so how good are these plants really? Um, and I decided to find out for myself. Uh, I began performing pollinator observations on the plants in the gardens and with the intent of using the results to inform the plantings in the gardens. Um, if something was attracting and supporting pollinators, then I would keep them. And if they weren't, then, you know, I'd take them out and bring something else in, hopefully, that would offer more. Um, so I looked at existing protocols from Penn State, Colorado State, and the Xerces Society, and then I adapted them for my situation um, because I had some slightly different um, circumstances um, from what they uh, we're doing. And of a colleague, um, my colleague Ann Fraser and a group of volunteers, we started collecting this data and did so for about five years. And in fact, Ann and one of those volunteers is 
now collecting same type of data at our Chatfield trial gardens on plant select plants. So come back to 2017, we're starting the design and the planning for this large renovation. You can see an idea board here. I had all of this information I've been collecting and this was a major project. We couldn't do this on our own. Uh, we worked with Didier Design Studios out of Fort Collins, Colorado, who beautifully visualized the potential of this area. Heiner Outdoor Living built our water feature and GH Phipps oversaw the entire project. Of course, COVID came along in the middle of this through some wrenches into the progress, into the progress, yeah. And finally, uh, we started demolition in early 2023. Here's an aerial view of the renovation in process. Um, the areas surrounded by orange were relatively untouched by construction, and we were able to keep those mature trees and shrubs and trees intact, which was really valuable. The pink area was gonna be a seating area around our monarchs and milkweed bed. We'd tell the monarch story here, but we'd also tell the story of our Colorado State insect, the Colorado hair streak and we would plant the gamble oaks on which this uh, butterfly depends. So here we are, those are our first oaks that we're adding to the garden. Um, blue uh, was the place where we'd create the hot, dry and sunny planting area that I wanted to display our regional natives. Uh, the grading was changing in this area pretty significantly and all the existing plants here had to be removed. So since that was getting removed anyways, it was gonna open it up, make a nice sunny area and we brought in loose, well-draining soil for those plants. Green, this, this green area, this is our pollinator garden using plants easily found in garden centers. Since one of our goals was to inspire homeowners to create more pollinator and habitat gardens. Um, we felt that this was important because many of the other areas were going to have wild collected species planted in them and some more unusual plants that would not easily be found in the train. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we had an area that uh, was more user-friendly. Um, and the soil mix that we used here had clay um, and loam for more, uh, for more soil, more moisture retention. We used this same soil with more moisture retention in this larger area circled in white over here. This is where South African Plaza had been, it's quite a large area. And this is where our willow glade was gonna go. Um, we created a water feature that had, um, was a little more subtle, it was a big waterfall, and it showed the ebb and flow of seasonally moist areas that are conducive to our native willows. And towards the top of that white area, you can see sort of a round area, which was going to be an overlook um, from our boardwalk. And as we went up in grade towards there, we could plant the more dry adapted willow species that we also would have here in Colorado. So with these areas of different soils, sun and shade, plants, moisture conditions, we were trying to support range of our native pollinators, in addition to bats, birds, small mammals, amphibians, and even more. So we didn't want just a pollinated meadow, pollinator meadow. Um, we wanted a complex layered habitat garden. So the whole range of our native pollinators. So we think of bees, moss, butterflies, and hummingbirds. Um, and we have 4,000 species of native bees in the state. Bumblebees big, bumblebees small. This one is about half the size of the previous one. Leaf cutter bees. Here's a Western leaf cutter bee, uh, but the alfalfa leaf cutter bee is found throughout North America. Longhorn bees, small sweat bees, some of which are metallic green. The longhorn bees, they pack a lot of pollen on the pollen, uh, the pollen sacs on their legs. And they always joke that they look like they've got like big, uh, like Serena Williams thighs. They have these big, really big pollen thighs. 
Um, wool carder bees, which actually are from Europe, but very well established here. And pebble bees, not as common, but easily recognized by their distinctive nest. You can see a little bee butt here sticking out of uh, this nest that she's creating. Also, we've got 750 butterfly species in the US, including swallowtails, hair streaks, and skippers. And I'm still trying to wrap my head around this, at least 17,000 moth species, 3,000 alone in Colorado. I'm gonna have to take a deep dive into the moth world <laughs> coming up. And 17 species of hummingbirds. But beetles and wasps and flies are also pollinators, not ones that we think about very much and not ones that get studied very often. So on this slide, you can see um, the first one up on the left. Um, these are called uh, soft bodied uh, flower beetles. Um, then we have jewel beetles, which also visit flowers, obviously our lady beetles, um, longhorn beetles and flower scarabs. So these all also perform pollinator functions, as well as wasps. I know that wasps get a really bad rep, but they're important and they're beneficial. And out of the 4,000 that we have, um, most of them are quite uninterested in stinging you. And last but not least, the flies. Yeah, not super sexy, not always super cute, although these are hover flies that often are mistaken for bees. And they're extremely important pollinators all around the world, especially at higher elevations where some of our other pollinators can't go. Um, they're also bioindicators of environmental health, um, but again, underappreciated and understudied. So we have to feed all of these. So I used all these spreadsheets that I'd been creating um, to our planting list, wanted a wide range of nectar and pollen plants blooming for as long a season as possible. Wanted different colors, shapes, and sizes to accommodate different tongue lengths, feeding habits, eyesight, what colors can they see, and flying abilities. Can they hover? Do they have to land? Can they fit inside flowers? Do they have to perch on top? So this list here are some of the main plants that we chose, um, many of which are also adaptable outside of our region and also that support uh, pollinators outside of our region. You can see I included trees and shrubs like chokecherries and currants. We often think of herbaceous perennials for pollinator gardens, but don't forget your canopy. It comes in very handy for early flowers and also helps create those complex layered plantings from trees to shrubs down to perennials and annuals to create that complex habit that's needed to support pollinators for their entire life cycle. Also milkweed on here, it isn't just for monarch caterpillars. Milkweed flowers are an excellent source of nectar and pollen, especially for native bees, adult butterflies and more. And the next time you see milkweed blooming, take the time to stop and look at it. A lot of times, um, they're so full of nectar that you can see uh, the flowers are brimming with nectar. Sometimes they, it even drips out of there. And then finally, some night blooming plants for those late flyers. So that covers food for adult stages, um, but we need host plants. We need food for the butterfly and moth caterpillars. So again, we're supporting the entire cycle of these uh, of these forms of wildlife. Host plants can be quite different, again, from the nectar and pollen plants that are utilized. And here I focus more on native plants. Um, the caterpillars and the plants that serve as their host plants have developed together over time. And you really can't just substitute in a different plant. Um, you can find a lot of different plants that will provide nectar and pollen um, but it's different with the host plants. Um, so here I definitely focus a lot more on host plants. You can see um, some like globe mallows, different kinds of mallows for the checkered skippers, painted ladies. Um, and here, um, oh wait, sorry, not, not to that slide yet. Um, 
this is where another, uh, where one of those oaks that we were compelled to include um, also came in, um, our gamble oak, Quercus gambellii. So we're on the Western edge of the Eastern monarch migration. So we don't see as many monarchs here. We see a few early in the spring, we see some in the fall, but their story captures people's imagination. You know, you hear people talk about gateway drugs. So if you think of monarchs as like gateway pollinators, people love monarchs, but hopefully they go further to learn about our other native pollinators that are also threatened. So we created the monarch bed, dedicated milkweeds, and we interpret that story, but we also plant gamble oaks and we tell the Colorado hair streak story. So this butterfly is endemic to Colorado and its whole world is the gamble oak. The hair streak roosts in gamble oak trees. They lay their eggs on the bark or the leaves and the emerging caterpillars feed on these. And the cycle continues. The adult hair streaks themselves feed very minimally, which is really not that unusual for adult butterflies. Some adult butterflies don't feed at all. Their lifespans are so short, they're totally focused on uh, creating their nests and um, setting up their young for survival um, and they just don't feed. Um, some forage, but instead of nectar and pollen, they feed on sap, they feed on raindrops, rotting fruit, even dung, uh, a couple other things I don't want to even mention here. Um, but so these are actually really good things to have in your garden, mud, rotting fruits, saps. I mean, all of these things are actually really good. So here's another list of some of the host plants that we included in this garden. Um, again, um, these are plants that can be used um, not just in our region, but other places as well, and also support butterflies and moss um, from across the United States. So here's more of those host plants and all of the different uh, butterflies and moss that they support. So those nectar and pollen plants that we were talking about before also support hummingbirds, not all of them, but some of them will do double duty. Um, however, the research shows that protein is as if not more important to hummingbirds than nectar. We always think about those red tubular plants for hummingbirds, um, but for protein, they feed on insects. They pick them off of plant foliage. They pick them out of spider webs or out of the air when they're on the fly. So the garden should be a haven for these insects um, as well as pollinators. So there should be spider webs catching insects in them. Um, and we should tolerate their mess. Um, leave the spider webs, um, leave the foliage that maybe gets damaged a little bit from them feeding on it, encourage them to take up resonance. So now we come to water, um, the next wildlife principle. So I said that stream that we created in the willow glade, which is more subtle, it's not a big water feature. That's the primary water source in the habitat garden area but we'll also utilize bird baths or shallow depressions in dead wood or on rocks where water collects. Water can be as simple as a bowl of water placed in a sunny location. It doesn't have to be a fancy water feature. Um, you just wanna clean it and refresh it regularly. You can put rocks and sticks in it to create perches where they can drink but not drown. And, uh, and it's really good to put them in a sunny area, maybe with some protection from wind, it makes it a little easy, easier for them to drink. Also muddy areas in the garden where water collects provide areas where butterflies can get uh, salts and minerals that they need, it's called puddling. And now the third and fourth habitat principles, um, shelter and nesting. I discuss these together because they're so interconnected um, and it's really hard to tease them apart. Um, this is one of the areas that I think I've learned the most about and also find so fascinating. So the majority of our native pollinators live very solitary lives, even the bees. So unlike honeybees with their large colonies, 
most native bees live entirely on their own. Bumblebees and sweat bees are a couple exceptions. And on top of that, 70% of those 4,000 native bees that we have in the US nest in the ground. So either in existing abandoned holes or they dig holes on their own, which I thought was pretty amazing and surprising. Um, if you ever get a chance to see this, it's quite amazing. Um, I've seen bees pulling rocks that are at least half their size backwards out of a hole that they're clearing, pushing the little rock. Um, it's a little tiny pebble, um, but it looks in comparison to them like a big boulder, um, pushing it aside and then going right back down um, for the next one. Um, some ground nesters like firmer soil, some like looser soil, sandy. Um, this is another reason for using some of those different soil mixes in the garden. Um, soil types is where you might see aggregations of bees. So lots of same, lots of the same bees nesting in the same area. And this could give the impression of colonies. Um, but usually if you look closely, these bees aren't actually working together. They just like the same conditions. Um, some like flatter, more compacted ground. Others prefer eroded vertical faces. Um, so this is a big reason to not use landscape fabric in the garden. Um, I don't like it anyways. Um, the dirt and the weeds just end up on top of it. And after a while, you've got this layer of dirt and weeds on top of the landscape fabric, then the landscape fabric, then you've got dirt underneath it and all these really anemic looking roots. Um, and so, and the bees definitely can't nest through the landscaping fabric. Um, so that's just another reason, I think, to just get rid of this stuff. And even mulch, honestly, will impede these bees from nesting in the ground. Studies have shown that even small gravel mulch or bark mulch will interfere. So you want to try to have areas of bare ground in the garden. It doesn't have to be the whole garden, um, but you can have areas that you leave um, probably in the sun, um, again, the sort of like warm, warmer areas. Um, so, or you can plant, just not use mulch, and you can plant densely, which will create a living mulch with the plants and the bees can still nest in those areas. So here's a fun example of a ground nester that I learned about um, a few years ago. This is the American sand wasp, uh, Bembix americana. It's found throughout much of the United States. It's very distinctive when you see it. The first time I ever saw one, I was like, oh my God, what is that? Um, it's pretty good size. It's about an inch long, I would say, with those big green eyes. Um, so this is in the Patagonia section of the step garden where the planting medium consists of expanded shale and sand. So there's no soil in there. It's just expanded shale and sand. It's very loose, very well draining. The plants from this area um, are adapted to very well draining soils. And about three years after we put that garden in, we noticed that hundreds of these sand wasps had started nesting in that loose sandy soil. And I mean hundreds. We didn't even want to walk into the garden to weed because we were worried about stepping on them and stepping on the nests that they were creating. They were completely uninterested in us. They weren't aggressive at all. They just went about their business. And this is a perfect example of that aggregation where they're all nesting in the same area because the soil is so conducive. But if you watch them, you could see they're not working together um, they're digging their own holes and they're nesting individually. I'm going to try to scoot along a little bit quicker because I can see that I'm uh, running a little bit late. Um, so a thousand bees in the U.S., uh, the other 30% that don't nest in the ground are cavity nesting bees. They make their homes in hollow plant stems, holes in wood, even between slats on a bench. They're, they're rather opportunistic. Um, so this is a great reason to leave old stumps in the garden, don't grind them, dead branches, leaf litter, and uncut plant stumps. So I know that all of this seems very contrary to what we've all been taught for so long, um, but our gardens have truly become a little too sterile. Um, years ago, I had to remove a cherry tree from my front yard. We didn't grind the stump. 
And within a week, there were bees nesting in that stump. It was fascinating. Um, so they will use existing holes. They might dig their own holes. They'll use uh, hollow plant stems. I know you see messages about not cutting back your garden in the fall and waiting for spring, but you really don't want to cut spring either because these bees have very short lives. And as soon as they emerge in the spring, they immediately start nesting again. So they need those uncut stems. Um, so one thing that I like to uh, suggest to people is that you could leave areas in the back of your garden where you'd leave things uncut and maybe a little bit messier. And then in the front of the garden, um, you could use more your usual practices where things are cut and maintained and trimmed and a little bit neater. We also used uh, bee hotels in the garden and they absolutely do work. Um, but the most important thing is they're not maintenance free. A lot of people think they're cute and they put one up and then they just leave it. Um, but the native bees that will nest in here are vulnerable to pests and diseases, just like honeybees. Um, so the health hotels need to be cleaned. Um, it's also important that the size of the holes, the depth of the holes need to be um, need to be um, a certain certain sizes. So female bees um, nesting in here, they actually pick the ratio of males to females. So they pick the sex of their eggs. So what they're going to do is they're going to try to pick a ratio of male to females that will give them the most survival success. Um, and if they don't have enough room to work with, they won't be able to create that optimal ratio. So you can see here on this slide, um, you can see a cross section of one of these uh, cavity nesters. This is a leaf cutter bee. And you can see how they she lines each of the cells in her nest with pieces of leaves that they cut from rose leaves or things like that. Um, she leaves a little pollen loaf in there, a mixture of pollen and nectar, so that when the egg hatches, the uh, young have something to feed on right away. And then in the spring, eventually, um, they all emerge from their hotel. It's pretty fascinating. And different bees use different plant debris to line their nests. So you've got leafcutter bees use the leaf pieces. Mason bees use um, mud like mortar, another reason for muddy areas in the garden. And wool carter bees use plant hairs. They scrape plant hairs off of things like um, lamb's ears um, and they use those to lay their nests. One of my favorites, the pebble bees, nest in these unique mounds that they build on the sides of rocks, um, in the intersections and plant stems between the stem and where, where, where it branches out or in pine cones. Um, they make a, they mix together resin and small rocks and they create these on, on the side. Um, we, I mostly see them on the sides of rocks. Um, they're fascinating. I just love them. Um, and this nest on the right was the first one I ever saw. It's the size of shape of a granola bar. It was huge and I was totally dumbfounded and had to go find somebody and find out what it was. Um, you could see the holes where the bees had emerged. And so we uh, collected this since it wasn't being used anymore. And it's now stored with our insect collection in our herbarium. Finally, butterflies. You see these butterfly houses, but they don't work. Um, I've never heard anybody say that they work. Um, butterflies and moths lay their eggs on their host plants or near their host plants. The caterpillars feed on the host plant and they either pupate there or they drop down to the soil at the base of the plant and overwinter among leaves. So that's why it's important to leave the leaves. You hear that message as well. Um, if you rake them up and move them out of the garden or you shred them and then lay them down as compost, then you're destroying potentially that life. Um, so the best thing to do is to just leave the leaves there um, and allow, allow the butterflies and the moths to nest. Um, and hummingbirds use all kinds of plant debris for their nests. Grasses, silky seed heads from milkweed pods and clematis. They even use spider webs. Um, so even more reason to have plant debris in the garden. 
I'm still learning a lot about beetles and wasps and flies and how to support them. A lot of these principles um, apply to them as well, the flowers that they'll also visit, um, but I'm still collecting data on the more specific details um, and, uh, and hope, to, hope to be able to include that in my presentation um, in years to come. So one thing, um, and we've gone through the food, the water, the shelter and the nest, uh, shelter and nesting. Um, one unusual thing in preparation for this garden um, that we came across was a talk by John Little from England. He is the owner of um, what's called the Grass Roof Company, based outside of London. He does amazing work with habitat panels, planters, and brownfield landscapes. And in this webinar, he talked about how death is a naturally occurring part of the life cycle, yet we completely remove it from our gardens. Uh, he says, disturbance and death is part of the process. Don't preclude it. So we decided to really embrace it. We went to a great deal of trouble to collect large amounts of dead wood from our York and Chatfield locations and brought it into this garden. So we were planting live plants, but we were also kind of planting or installing dead plants as well. Nigel Dunnett, who's also British, has done a lot of work to repopularize the dead hedge and log piles, uh, especially in conjunction with naturalistic gardening. So we collected materials for over a year prior to this installation to build features which would bring that decay into this otherwise sterile garden. These are just a few of the piles that we had stored in our service lot. It was actually along this fence in the back. It was 60 feet of fence taken up with material stacked about six feet high and six feet deep. We had stashes in the back of gardens, under nursery benches. We had things everywhere. And every time the arborist started working, we were right there um, to collect the materials. While these piles were sitting in storage, waiting to be moved into the garden, birds actually started nesting in them. So we were super excited. It was working. Some more of the stuff that we were collecting, uh, large, large logs, um, all different kinds of rocks, um, different kinds of bark. Um, and sometimes your weird colleagues just wear their bark. <laughs> this is Kevin Williams who worked on the installation with me in one of our silly moments. So we used all this dead to create um, all different kinds of things that we called standing dead or snags. These are big old uh, tree trunks um, that have been cut that we installed, bark piles. And uh, some of my favorites, Kevin created these amazing dead walls. They're part habitat experience, part privacy screen, because we are right smack up against all of our neighbors. Um, and they're material libraries, all those hollow stems, branches, bark that any creature might crawl in to use or even take and borrow. Each one was kind of a puzzle that, to create. This was one of the largest, we called it the wood wave. This is the dead hedge. It's about 25 feet long and about six feet high at the highest point. This was created by stacking, compressing, and weaving together sticks and branches and brush. It's quite amazing how much material you can feed into these dead hedges. We had all of that material stored around the gardens. No one thought we'd ever use it all. And they kept trying to get us to put it in the compost to free up space but we easily used all of it and we're gonna need more this coming season. And the dead hedge also is a repository for all that organic debris that's generated by your garden. With a dead hedge or a dead wall or a log pile, you can actually keep all that biomass in your garden. Our goal is to not remove any plant debris from this garden. It's just all gonna go back into these dead hedges. And this spring, we'll start installing our last uh, feature wall. Um, this, is a, this is a prototype for the piece um, that we'll be starting to work on soon. And it'll be ready by the time um, you all come this summer. 
one of the questions we get is about maintenance. And yes, of course, these things need maintenance. They're gonna break down over time with snow and summer heat. So we'll tend them, we'll modify them, we'll redesign them just like we do with the living plant material in the garden. We're creating this complex layered habitat um, that uh, Kevin Tuck refers to as life rafts, um, calling the gardens, these habitat gardens, life rafts. Soon after the water feature was finished and turned on, we were able to see it being put to good use. The birds were bathing, the frogs and the toads, and we had a plethora of tadpoles swimming in it. So this was all good news. And one of the saddest parts of building the new garden was the destruction of the old one that, and the creatures that we thought we might be driving away. In the height of the tear out, there was a snowstorm and Kevin went out for a walk and behind the construction fence and this little friend came out to play with him. Kevin took this as a really encouraging moment as an omen that we were on the right path. Um, so we know diversity is stability. Diversity leads to resilience, adaptivity and recovery. And if we want our gardens to be these life rafts, we need to maintain them with different points of views and practices and with different species and habitats in mind. There isn't a single way that we're gonna save the earth but as gardeners and horticulturists, these are some of the ways that we can put our talents to good use. And I've found that I don't feel like I'm really making a sacrifice here. Um, you know, we talk a lot about climate change and the sacrifices that we make. Um, but in the process of doing this, um, I just feel so much more connected. It brings me a lot of joy and happiness every time I think about those little sand wasps nesting. And um, it just, it makes me very happy. It makes me feel very connected. And I keep doing this because I want more of those experiences. So I've got my resource list um, here with all, a lot of those resources that I use to put together all of those plant lists. Um, I do also just wanna do one last thing. I hope this is okay. Um, Kevin and I that worked on this installation together, we each have a books coming out this year. Um, Shrouded in Light is by Kevin Philip Williams and also Michael Geedy, who's from the Botanic Gardens. That's gonna be coming out in May. And this is the Pollinators of the American West book um, that Victoria referred to. This is a collaborative project between the gardens and the Butterfly Pavilion. Um, and that's, that's it. Thanks so much for having me. And I'm so sorry I went late. Thank you, Sonia. And we have a couple of questions for you, too. So, um, and someone asked if you could show the resource list page again, and then I'll read the questions for you while okay. you're bringing that up. <laughs> I went back to it. Can you see it? Yes. Yes. Okay. Good. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So for the, the questions, um, for everyone on here, this is a question for us actually is, will the webinar be recorded? And I typed in the answer, but it is, yes, it is going to be recorded and it will be posted on the NGC website. Um, and the next question was the plant list that you showed. Mm -hmm. um, can you make that available to us so people can print it? Um, can that, what, does it, Suffice that they can go to the recording and see it there. Does that work? Or is there another way that we should do that? Um, uh, photo right now, you know, to take a snap of it and have it on their desktop. She meant screen share. If you went back to the slide, people could screen share oh, okay. yeah. and then save it. Okay, yeah. there we go. Yeah, go I don't there. know if she sent it to us, if there's a place to post it. Well, but if we put it in the questions right now, they'll see it. I just don't think they can get it. I think they have to do their own. They could screen share it on their computers. All right, so I'll go back to the, let's see, here we go. The, all right. 
Um, so that's the nectar and pollen plants. I can leave that up for. There it is. That's couple, the one. Okay. Yeah. And then if then then after a couple, uh, I don't know how long people take need to make a copy of that, and then I can go to the host plant list. Yeah. I know the the plant lists are always important. It's hard to try to cover uh, so many areas, but I tried to focus on um, the plants that are more, I don't know, universally useful. Okay. And Should I go to the host plant list? Yeah, now? I okay. think you can go to the host plants now. All right, so that's the first page. Okay, everybody take a picture if that's what you want. Screenshot. And then I think you can go to the next one. All righty. Okay. And is that the last one? Uh, yeah. You're, okay. Yeah. Other than the resources. Yeah. Okay. I think, I think that's, uh, great. Um, and then another question was, um, a native bee bomb here in South Carolina is, I'll probably mess up pronouncing this, but Mondare, Mon, oh, Monarda. Erda, yep. Mm -hmm. At the garden centers, they're just labeled bee bomb. Yeah. Um, so where would you find specific native plants for your area and does it matter? Um, I feel like um, I'm not a native plant purist um, when it comes to gardening for pollinators. Um, I, you know, when I was doing those observations, um, if I, you know, honestly, when I was doing those observations in the top 10 most visited plants, at least half of them, if not more, weren't native plants. Um, now I didn't include all of those in the garden because some of them are really weedy. Um, and so I don't want to, um, I don't want, you know, I don't want to end up you know, focus on a plant that ends up being a problem, a weed problem. So um, I, if it, the main thing is that for, for the nectar and pollen, if it is providing resources, um, then I think it's fine to use non-natives. Um, but it's really with the host plants, I think, where you really have to especially focus on the natives because you can't just substitute something else for a host plant. Um, but, you know, one of the things that, you know, is, uh, is watch, you know, if you have something in your garden and you don't ever see something, a pollinator visiting it, then for some reason it's either not attractive or, you know, double plants, um, mm -hmm. plants that are more hybridized. A lot of times the, um, um, the nectar and pollen after it's been hybridized is either not there, it's in reduced quantities, or it's buried so deep in all of those extra petals that the pollinators can't get to it. Um, so, um, so if you're going to use non-natives, then at least use ones that are just like simple flowers, not doubles or anything like that. Um, and getting natives is challenging. I've only got resources for the Colorado area. I don't know. Um, but a lot of times um, uh, the extension agent, the mm -hmm. extension offices um, with gardeners, um, I don't, you know, a lot of times they'll have plant sales and they'll have more native, uh, native yeah. plants. Yep. And I think someone had uh, put that in as a, potential answer for them was to go to online areas um, at nurseries in their area or agricultural um, colleges and universities yeah. or the wildlife um, garden for wildlife uh, yeah. focuses on native plants. 
Yeah, and I know we have wild ones here. Um, I know they have uh, chapters elsewhere and they have plant sales and seed swaps and things like that. Um, yeah. And they're uh, often native plants. Okay, and then the next question is, when's the best time to clean bee hotels? And the answer that was given was, it's a hotel is much harder to manage than a singular focus. If you have a singular focus, clean in that area the week they hatch out and replace quickly. Um, do you have any other suggestions for best time to clean a bee hotel? Um, uh, yeah, it is kind of tricky. I mean, if you have the same kind of, like they're all leaf gutter bees, they're probably all going to be emerging around the same time. Um, and so that's a good time to do it. Um, I think you could also do it in the winter when they're dormant, just as mm -hmm. long as you're really careful. I mean, some places actually recommend taking, removing the tubes from the insect hotels and taking them um, inside to like a cool dry place, like the same place where you would store your like dahlia tubers or something like that. Um, I, th that's tends to be for people who are actually trying to raise leaf cutter bees. So I tend to not do that. Um, but that would be, if you do do that, that would be an opportunity to do it. Um, I think that's probably, you know, if you can't uh, do it right after they emerge, I think the winter is probably the best time to do it. Just doing